Hey everyone, this is Fixer Med, and welcome to my high yield anatomy review for the USMLE Step 1 NBME CBSE and NBME CAS examinations. This will be part one of my multi part video series covering general anatomy for these examinations. Now, keep in mind, more pertinent information pertaining to organ system blocks will be found in the organ system blocks high yield review series, which will be coming out shortly. So keep that in mind as you utilize this general anatomy review when approaching these examinations. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna start off this review by talking about lumbar punctures and the associated epidural anesthesia. During a lumbar puncture, a needle is inserted into the subarachnoid space to extract cerebrospinal fluid perform a spinal tap, or administer anesthesia or contrast material for a spinal block. The standard insertion site for the needle is typically between the L3, L4, or L4, L5 vertebrae, corresponding to the level of a horizontal line drawn through the upper points of the iliac crest. It is crucial to note that the spinal cord may terminate as low as L2 in adults and end at L3 in young children, while the dural sac extends caudally to the level of S2. Prior to the procedure, it's essential to evaluate the patient for signs of increased intracranial pressure as herniation of cerebellar tonsils through the foramen magnum is a potential concern. And to the right, I have a picture of a lumbar puncture taking place. So you have a visual representation of what that process looks like. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the next topic. Next, I want to talk about herniated discs. Herniated discs typically happen in the lumbar L4, L5, or L5, S1, or the cervical region, C5, C6, or C6, C7, in individuals under 50. These herniations often result from degenerative changes in the adult's fibros, annual, degenerative changes in the annulus fibrosis, and sudden compression of the nucleus pulposus. In lumbar herniations, the affected disc usually involves the nerve root one level below, compressing the traversing root. Example, L4, L5 herniation compresses the L5 root. Let's move on to the next content. Next, we have abnormal curvatures of the spine. Kyphosis, an exaggerated thoracic curvature, can occur in the elderly due to osteoporosis, multiple compression fractures, or disc degeneration. Lordosis, an exaggerated lumbar curvature, may be temporary and is associated with pregnancy, spondylolisthesis, or a pot belly. Scoliosis, a complex lateral deviation or torsion, is caused by factors such as polyomyelitis, leg length discrepancy, or hip disease. So, let's test these concepts out, guys. First, NBME application based reasoning question. We have a 30 year old woman scheduled for a lumbar puncture to assess cerebrospinal fluid for a suspected neurological condition. During the procedure, the needle is inserted between the lumbar vertebrae to access the subarachnoid space. If the needle inadvertently enters the epidural space, what potential complication may occur? All right, I'll give you guys a few more seconds. All right, if you need more time, please feel free to pause the video. If not, moving on. So, when a lumbar puncture needle inadvertently enters the epidural space, instead of the intended subarachnoid space, it can cause bleeding and lead to the formation of an epidural hematoma. The epidural hematoma may compress the spinal cord and nerve roots within the spinal canal, resulting in neurological deficits and potentially severe complication. This complication highlights the importance of precise needle placement during lumbar puncture to avoid unintended trauma to the epidural vasculature and structures. Monitoring for signs of hematoma formation and addressing it promptly is crucial to prevent further neurological damage. Therefore, the correct answer is C, epidural hematoma. Let's go ahead and go through why the other answer choices are incorrect. 
A, meningitis. While meningitis is a potential complication of lumbar puncture, it is not directly related to the inadvertent entry into the epidural space. B, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Entering the epidural space does not lead to subarachnoid hemorrhage. D, cauda equina syndrome. Cauda equina syndrome is not a direct result of misplacement of the lumbar puncture needle into the epidural space. E, spinal cord injury. Direct injury to the spinal cord is not a typical complication of lumbar puncture needle misplacement into the epidural space. So now that we have that down, let's move on to the next question. So we have a 16 year old girl that presents with a noticeable lateral curvature of her spine. Upon examination, the physician observes asymmetry of the shoulders and pelvis. The patient reports occasional back pain, particularly after prolonged periods of standing. Radiographic imaging reveals a C or S shaped curve in the spine. What is the most likely diagnosis? Pretty easy question. If you guys remember the diagram from two slides ago. All right, I think I gave you guys enough time. If you need more time, please pause the video. Moving on now. The patient's presentation of a noticeable lateral curvature of the spine, asymmetry of the shoulders and pelvis, and a radiographic C or S-shaped curve is indicative of scoliosis. Scoliosis is a three-dimensional deformity characterized by lateral deviation of the spine, often diagnosed during adolescence. The observed asymmetry is a result of the curvature affecting not only the frontal plane, but also the sagittal and transverse planes. Scoliosis can lead to cosmetic deformity, postural imbalance, and in some cases, back pain. Early detection and appropriate management are crucial to prevent progression and complications. Therefore, the correct answer is C, scoliosis. Let's see why the other answer choices are incorrect. Shoreman's disease. Shoreman's disease is characterized by vertebral vegging in the thoracic spine resulting in a kyphotic deformity. It does not typically present with lateral curvature and asymmetry seen in scoliosis. Kyphosis. Kyphosis involves an exaggerated forward curvature of the thoracic spine leading to a rounded or hunched back. It does not manifest as lateral curvature or asymmetry of the shoulders and pelvis as observed in the patient. Lordosis. Lordosis is an exaggerated inward curvature of the lumbar spine. It does not cause lateral deviation of the spine or asymmetry of the shoulders and pelvis, which are characteristic features of scoliosis. Ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing, ankylosing spondylitis is an inflammatory condition primarily affecting the sacroiliac joint and spine. It typically presents with inflammatory back pain and stiffness, but does not cause lateral curvature of the spine as seen in scoliosis. So those are why those answer choices are incorrect. Let's move on to the next question. A 45 year old man presents with sharp lower back pain that radiates down his left leg, along with numbness and tingling in the same leg. Physical examination reveals reduced sensation along the L5 dermatome and weakness and dorsiflexion of the left foot. Straight leg raising test is positive, exer exacerbating the pain. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Give you guys a few more seconds for this one. All right, thank you. You guys have had enough time. Uh, if you need more time, pause the video. If not, moving on now. The patient's presentation with sharp lower back pain, radicular symptoms down the left leg, positive straight leg raising tests, and weakness and dorsiflexion of the left fo foot is consistent with lumbar disc herniation. The herniated disc compresses the spinal nerve roots, leading to radiculopathy and neurological deficits. The L5 nerve root involvement as evidenced by reduced sensation along the L5 dermatome and weakness in dorsiflexion is a common finding in lumbar disc herniation. Therefore, the correct answer is D, lumbar disc herniation. Keep that in mind. Uh, we'll be going over this more in MSK, so 
don't worry if these questions seem a little harder. They are, at the end of the day, um, just general anatomy questions that are designed for high yield, step one and CBSE prep. So let's go ahead and explain why the other intertwists are incorrect. Lumbar spinal stenosis. Lumbar spinal stenosis typically presents with neurogenic claudication and symptoms relieved by flexion of the spine. It does not commonly cause radicular symptoms with positive straight leg raising tests. Sacroiliitis. Sacroiliitis involves inflammation of the sacroiliac joint and is not likely to cause radicular symptoms or weakness in dorsiflexion. Piriformis syndrome. Piriformis syndrome is characterized by buttock pain due to compression of the sciatic nerve by the piriformis muscle. It does not typically cause weakness in dorsiflexion or reduce sensation along a dermatome. Spondylolisthesis. Try saying that three times real fast. Spondylolisthesis refers to the anterior displacement of one vertebra over another and can cause back pain and neurogenic claudication. It is less likely to produce radicular symptoms and neurological deficits in dorsiflexion compared to lumbar disc herniation. So guys, I just want to clarify this video series is more so designed for people who just need a quick general anatomy overview. If you need a more foundational prep series for anatomy, uh, wait until the MSK series is out. MSK will be going through all of this stuff in a very detailed and comprehensive manner. This is designed for people who just need high yield anatomy just to refresh it in their minds to get some quick points on the step one and CBSE. They've already fin probably finished med school or they finished their two years. They just need to pass this test and move on to the next stage in their training. So with that in mind, guys, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or suggestions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. As always, this is Fixer Med signing off. Be sure to have a great day, everyone. Study hard. Goodbye.